And uh, I think we are live. Hi, Rob. Hello, Mikhail. Nice to be here on your The Bright Vibes. It's saying, I love seeing you always. You know that, man. Where, where, where are you today? I'm in uh, Orlando, Florida, which is where I just moved two months ago. And uh, I'm staying with my friend Sarah here. Wonderful. I'm, uh, I'm here in Utrecht, in the Netherlands, at the Bright Vibes HQ. And um, it's, a, it's a pleasure having you here. Um, what we're going to do today, we're going to talk about minimalism for beginners. And, uh, you know, Rob, to be honest, I, I am very interested in the subject because I definitely see myself as uh, uh, one. I could really use all, all your tips. I'm trying to buy less and, and live more sustainably. And, um, yeah, I'd, I'd love to hear, Rob, how, how you got started. Um, uh, but before we do that, actually, I can see that we already got like nine reactions coming in. People are tuning in. Um, do let us know where you're tuning in from. So tell us which country are you from and which city or village you're logging in from. And uh, if you have any questions for Rob, uh, you can ask me questions as well. But if you have any questions for Rob, uh, do leave a comment and uh, we'll pick them up and we'll get, we'll get as many answered as possible. Um, Rob, but can you start by explaining how you ended up living with 111 uh, things? Sure. sure. Yeah. yeah. Minimalism, minimalism for the beginners. beginners and I, think that, that I at one time was a beginner. So I used to have a lot of stuff. I don't know the amount, but it was probably over 10,000 possessions. And uh, one day, uh, actually one of my earliest inspirations was when I watched The Story of Stuff, which is a short film online about you know, where all of our stuff comes from, the impact that it has on people, on the planet, on the earth, uh, uh, you know. And so um, basically I was clueless about where everything came from and the impact that it had on my life and others. And once I started to educate myself, I realized, wow, I just have way too much stuff and it's not making me happier. happy. I think I would be happy with less. Yeah, and um, so so now you have one hundred and eleven possessions. How many how many things did you have like let's say five years ago? And what 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 was your lifestyle like at that time? So I had um, well, I had a three bedroom apartment back in two thousand eleven, and my mindset was at that time when I got the apartment, I chose the biggest room. You know, rather than the smallest room, I wanted the biggest room in the apartment. And then I had the big storage closet as well, my car that could fill, be filled with lots of stuff. So I was never a hoarder, but I certainly fit in with the average American lifestyle of having a lot of stuff and ultimately basing my own worth uh, and value on stuff. So we got a lot of people uh, telling us where they're tuning in from. Should we yeah. some of those out? Let's see, we got people from really all over the world. We've got uh, Keith Parkins from Middlesbrough in the UK. There's Ria from Amarillo, Texas. There's Lala Welsh. Let's see, where does she come from? She's already got a question. Her, her question is how to get rid of things responsibly. It takes time, doesn't it? How, yeah. so, so how did you do that from 20,000 or whatever it is to 111? What did you do with your stuff? Where did it end up? Well, so, yeah, that's a great question. How to get rid of things responsibly. It takes time. And that it does take time. And that's probably the most important thing to go off first is that, you know, great change doesn't happen overnight. It starts with making one small change and then making another small change and another small change. Whether we're talking about stuff or we're talking about living a more sustainable life or we're talking about just becoming better at a sport, everything starts somewhere and the only somewhere you can start is exactly where you are right now and the only person you can be is you so you have to just embrace your situation and start there and i wouldn't recommend the idea of going from who you are now to radically trying to transform yourself overnight because the problem is i think that the likeliness of you shocking your system and possibly having a mental breakdown could be pretty high if you just do everything overnight. I think it's kind of dangerous. So what I would recommend is a transition. Don't be overwhelmed. You're in the situation that you're in 
and take it one step at a time. Start to go through your house and just, you know, one weekend or weekday if you don't work or go to school during the weekdays, just go through your house and just get a box or two of stuff that you don't use that you don't want anymore and bring it to a thrift shop or uh, invite friends over and have them take stuff. And so that will give you a taste of the feeling of downsizing and getting rid of clutter. And hopefully that will feel good and then you can take it further. But the point is, you've got to go one bit at a time. Exactly. That's great advice. We got a very interesting question here from Tanner Blake, who is asking us, I think I'll just publish it now. Let's see. There it is. Um, Tanner's question is, how do I get rid of sentimental items? So, Rob, of those 111 that you still own, some of them, are, I guess, have sentimental value, but you got rid of many of them. How, how did you do that? How, yeah, it must, must be difficult to detach yourself from certain things. Yeah. Actually, currently, I don't have a single possession with sentimental value um, because I got past that stage. I mean, mm -hmm. they were like, you know, this pot right here, this is one of my most prized possessions. I take this everywhere I go. I've camped, I've camped and cooked with this over fires and people's houses, probably, you know, 100, 200 places. And it's also my to-go container. If I go to a restaurant and I get leftovers, the pot uh -huh. is up and I can put food inside there. So it'd be easy to have a sentiment to this because, you know, it does mean a lot to me and it's, and and I've used it in so many places, so there's a lot of memories tied to it. But there is no sentiment, actually. It does it, – because what I do is I am mostly choosing things based on the value it adds to my life and being able to accomplish tasks uh, and live sustainably. And this pot or any other pot would do the job. But to answer that question, mm -hmm. one of the best ways to deal with sentimental items – is to find a new positive sentiment for them. So let's say they're musical instruments. Like let's say you have five guitars and you have this guitar that you love from a long time ago and you just can't get rid of it. What I would suggest is find possibly a child with no guitar, their first guitar, or someone who just can't afford a guitar and give it to them. You know, someone who will love it and cherish it and let the memories not just live on, but actually create more memories with it. And maybe give it to someone you know where every year or maybe every month you'll see them and you can see that guitar getting used. Maybe you'll donate it to a nonprofit uh, where you know they give opportunities to underserved children. So I think you can take those sentimental items and mm -hmm. actually part ways with them in a way where rather than feeling that dread, you actually feel that excitement to have, have it live on. And if you and if you look at what things that you got rid of, which you did have a sen right like right now the example you gave like I don't have a sentimental value you know attached to things anymore, but I'm sure that you had certain things where you did have that. Can you give an example of something you gave away to someone? Just like you, you, you could, the guitar is a great example, but what did you actually? Uh, who who do you make happy with something that had sentimental value for you? Yeah, so I used to travel a lot around the world. I guess I still do some, but not as much as I used to. And I picked up a lot of things from far off countries that were really one of a kind and really special, not just like knickknacks from the store, but people giving me things. And and I was these had major sentimental items. For example, when I was in Kenya in 2010, um, a friend that I made there gave me a gourd and this gourd uh, is something that... Is that? Uh, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm Dutch. So I don't know what a gourd is. Maybe there are other people that are not native speakers. Can you explain what that is? A gourd is like a pumpkin that dries out. So, so when it dries, it becomes like a hollow container and it can be used yeah. for like a drinking container or a food container. So, Got you it. know, so um, I don't have it anymore. Otherwise, I'd show it to you. <laughs> But um, so what they would do in his tribe in Kenya is they would put milk and ashes into it and they would it fermented under a tree for a week uh, or, or longer. And then they'd have this fermented beverage called they called it milik. And this was not, you know, he gave me this and it was something that had been used many times and that had been made in the tribe where he grew up. And it meant, you know, it meant so much to me. It was yeah. beyond that. It was also just beautiful. 
Um, so what I did is that was one of the things I held on to till, you know, the very end. And what I did is I gave that to my sister who also loved it. And now when I visit her, if I go back to San Diego, I can see it out there. But I know that she loves it and she's getting a lot out of it. Yeah. And uh, she, do you, so you have an extra reason to go back and see your sister, right? Yeah, I mean, I'm not going to see my sister for the gourd, but. <laughs> uh, let's see, we got a question here up from uh, Paula McCoy. Um, I want to feel joy and excitement in in purging. Um, where do I where do I start? I get so overwhelmed. I think it's uh, something we just we, we talked about just a little bit earlier. But let's see. Um, just even starting, I, I can't see the forest through the trees. So what would you what, what what is your advice for Paula? Yeah, I would say you know one of one of the things that I would do is every six or twelve months I would go through the possessions in my house and. I didn't have as much as a lot of people did. So I was able to actually go through in a day and see almost everything I owned. But for some people, just to see everything they own could take weeks of digging through boxes. But yeah. anyway, what I would do is just go through most everything I owned. doesn't have to be that. And then everything I came across, I would say, have I used this in the last six months or a year or not? And is this bringing value to my life or is it just something being stored, taking up space and taking up not just physical space, but mental space. So, you know, that would be my suggestion to you is so you just got to start somewhere. Get one or two empty boxes. Don't go to the store and buy boxes. Just get one out of the recycle bin and just fill up one or two boxes of useful things that you don't use and take them to a thrift shop. That is like very basic way to start. Or Another thing you can do is have a gifting party where you take a bunch of the stuff that you don't want, you set it out in your living room or in your kitchen, and then you have a party where all of your friends can come over and take anything they want. So make sure, make sure, Rob, that you tell them not to bring any gifts because, oh. you know, that would be. Yes, it's only you gifting. No one brings anything. Oh, exactly. yeah. um, I would say the one thing to be careful of is make sure that you like separate it so that they don't take a bunch of stuff you do want. Um, so that's why I said put it all in one room, like the kitchen or the living room or something like that. So that can be a great fun party of, of a way to get rid of things too. Yeah, great idea. Let's see, what, what other question do we have that we can, uh, we can pick up? Let's see. Um, well, we'll go and look, we'll go and look for, for, for a great question. Um, let's see. Uh, what are, for you, Rob, the major advantages of living a minimalistic lifestyle? What did you gain instead of lose? Yeah. So most people, when they think of, you know, downsizing and they think of getting rid of stuff, they think of what they're going to be missing out on and what they're going to be lose, losing. I mean, it's, you know, people say giving up. So, but the, the reality of what my experience has been is that the more that I've given up, the more that I've actually received. And it's counterintuitive to the mainstream narrative in a lot of Western countries where ultimately you are your possessions and your your wealth comes from the things that you have to show off to others. So it's counterintuitive to that. But what I've found is the more that more the more stuff that I got rid of the more time that I had to do the things that I really want. Because stuff, it consumes your time. Mm -hmm. Here's a couple of reasons why. The more stuff you have in your home or apartment, the more cluttered it is, the harder it is to clean it. It takes more time. The more likely your closet is to get disorganized and then you have to spend Saturday afternoon just organizing things. So those are a couple of aspects of it. But And the other important part about it that is that the more cluttered your physical places, often the more cluttered your mental places. Those two things, physical and mental clutter, go hand in hand. So if you do feel cluttered in here, one of the best ways to, to get rid of that is to get rid of the clutter in your physical place. Um, and the other thing is money. You know, there's a saying, time is money. And uh, I don't believe that. Time is just time. However, one of the things that I would start to do is I would literally, you know, when I was working a lot for money and lived a life that was revolving around money, I would ask myself, 
with these things, okay, if I were to monetize the amount of time it took to it takes to own this thing, like for example, if a cell phone bill is a hundred dollars a month and you're making ten dollars an hour, then ten ten hours per month are going just so that you can have that. And so the question becomes, would I rather be doing something with that ten hours? that you're passionate about. It could be volunteering. It could be spending time with your loved ones. Um, would I, could I be doing something else with that 10 hours rather than working to pay for something that maybe I don't need? So I just, I, it freed up my time, freed up my mental uh, state. And ultimately one of the other biggest things is I just lost most of my stress. It just, my life has become much more relaxed and, and stress-free. Yeah. And how, how um, in that sense, when people ask you, you know, uh, like people ask me, I'm a few, and they ask, and who are you? They don't ask, who are you? They, they basically want to know what you do. And what they do is they basically ask, well, what do you do to make a living? How do you make a living, Rob? Um, so I make a living mostly by living simply. That's the first and foremost aspect of it. So when yeah. we're talking about minimalism, I practice minimalism, not just with physical possessions, but throughout most of my whole life. So the less I need, the less money I need to need, the less I need to work. And so ultimately now my focus is, you know, for a lot of people, 40, 50, 60 hours a week go into work. And for a lot of those people, they don't even really like their work. So I said, I'm not subscribing to that system. Instead, I want to find, I want to spend the vast majority of my time doing what I love and then work a small amount of time for the money that I do need. And uh, so the money that I do make comes from public speaking. Um, 100% of my media income is donated directly to nonprofits from the TV shows that I've done, from my book, all of those things, because I really need very little money. So last year I made $5,000 total. Um, I found that to be a little bit too little. So this year it'll be $10,000 or so or, or, or less. Um, yeah. But really, no question, I make a living by living simply. And the speaking is is a small portion. But also, I'm only doing the speaking because I want to. I'm being ultimately paid to do something that I want to do. And that's the most ideal scenario, I think, is doing a job where it doesn't feel like a job, where it's what you really, really want to do. Yeah, let's see. We got somebody. Can you let's just scroll up a bit? There is somebody who asked a question. Like we've already asked the question, but I'm confused. Let's see if we can. Yeah, it's a uh, Beard Wagenaar. Uh, welcome, Beard. He says, Rob, I'm sorry if this was asked already, but I'm very curious if nostalgia or precious memories weigh heavier. Yeah, yeah, we talked. We talked about that. Let's see. So then, uh, Beard, sorry. The best thing to do probably is to just um, uh, once we finish this Facebook Live. Video will be up, and you can you can watch how uh, how Rob deals with that. Um, let's see, do we have another interesting question? Oh, we've got Eleanor. Just uh, just just thirty seconds of shout outs. We've got Eleanor Platt, um, who uh, thanks you for supporting Lily. I don't know if you know Lily. Lily lives in the Netherlands. She's I think she's like a, a ten or eleven year old girl, and she um, in her free time she picks up litter. She's pretty pretty amazing. I think did you meet her? I saw your video on her, and I'm actually making a video about her uh, right now. You are? Really? Yeah. Oh, wow. That's great. We'll definitely share that one. Yeah. Um, there's somebody, somebody asking you, that's Darla Joy Sorensen. She's asking if you are going to green, go green biking again, Rob. Um, so she's talking about green riders, Darla, and that was my bike ride across the country, across the United States last summer, where uh, about 30 people joined. Um, that was, I, I intend to do it again in my lifetime, but I don't have any plans as of now to do another Green Riders tour. No. What you mentioned, Rob, when we talked earlier, which I found really interesting, is that um, you're currently, so you are in Orlando and you are settling for the next two years. You can talk at the end of this video about your new project. Um, but the last for the last two years, you've been living at um, other people's places. For how, how, many, how many places did you stay? Yeah, so in when I was in San Diego, uh, up until two years ago, I lived in a little 50-square-foot tiny house. At that time, I had about 600 possessions to my name or so. Um, 
And I lived there for a year off the grid, had gotten my life down to not having a single bill or debt to my name. And then uh, my partner and I decided that we wanted to travel for a while. So we traveled for two years. That's when I got my life down to 111 possessions where everything fit in my backpack and total weight, I think, 38 pounds, so about 20 kilos. Of and show me your backpack, Rob. Do you, have it, do you have it there? So I actually don't have a backpack anymore because... <laughs> that is, is so consistent. <laughs> this summer, when I did my bike ride across the country, I got rid of my backpack and traded it in for bicycle panniers, which these are what go on the side of the rack of a bicycle so that when you're riding, you can be carrying stuff on your bike rack, which if we're talking about minimalism, this is one of the most important possessions is a bicycle. I with, agree. It's a Dutchman. I can only agree. Yeah. yeah. With a bike rack and panniers is a French word, I believe. And so the, you can do your, your errands. You can go grocery shopping. Um, you know, they, you can fit about two, you know, decent sized grocery bags in there. Um, and, you know, a big part of minimal, minimalism is not having a car because what I found was that the average American spends about $7,000 per year on their vehicle. And when I had a car back in 2011 is when I, or 2012 is when I got rid of it. I was spending just that about $7,000 a year. So I traded in my car for a bike, save over $6,000 a year and instead can do other. Well, now I don't make that much money, but for that time when I still was, I could put that $6,000 a year into uh, local nonprofits and things like that and give back rather than just having a car. Yeah. So I think I was a little sidetracked there. Doesn't matter. Going back, going back to the question about the green, about the green riders. Um, and there's like a word, a little bit of a wordplay there. It's like some people could think that if you travel around for two years and you live at other people's places that you are basically free riding. Yeah. Um, so those other people, they have to, you know, they have to pay this mortgage and, a la 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 and do all the work that they, many of them actually are not happy with how how do you respond how do you respond to that yes so that is a very important thing to bring up so we had we generally function in 2017 society on a very linear transaction system that's the monetary one it's i give you this you give me that and it's supposed to be an equal value uh so i give you $50 and you give me this jacket and that's the way that a lot of people's mindset works but that is only a fairly new mindset and that's only existed for a tiny fraction of the existence of humans so what i do is uh, mine is a much more circular form of transaction so i focus on giving of myself and giving of my resources to as large of an extent as i can now i'm not asking for anything in return when i do that the hope is that they will then do something for somebody else. Some people call that paying it forward. You could say that my whole life is based on paying it forward. Yeah. Um, and so sometimes, like, for example, where I'm staying right now for a month, I'm building her a garden. I'll just show you really quick. This is the, yeah. Yeah. This is, this is the garden. Can you see it out there? Yeah, I can. Yeah. I've got this giant garden going into the front yard. And so I'm not paying rent, but instead I'm creating a, a huge garden that will produce food for her for years and years to come. Wow. Um, and so, yeah, I've stayed in about 200 places over the last two years. And that's always my goal is to be giving more than I receive. And that doesn't mean that in every scenario, like sometimes people help me and I don't necessarily give them anything. But maybe the next person I see, I give something to them and they don't give something to me. Now, with that being said, you also can't look so literally at giving because what I found is that often what people need is just somebody to talk to, somebody to be their friend, someone to be there for them. And so a lot of times when people do help me in my mission, it's not necessarily altruistic. They're doing it because one of the best feelings in the world is helping others. And so often being able to let people help makes their day. <laughs> it sure does. Yeah, exactly. That's, 
I absolutely love that. I mean, there's so much more than if you talk about possessions or value. There's so much more than than currency and 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 money and bank accounts. And I think the most valuable thing, basically, that we can give to others is real attention. Absolutely. And someone just asked uh, about a cell phone. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Sorry about that. You were talking about uh, something that was really interesting. Yeah. What about your cell phone? Do you have a cell phone? Or do you have it organized? It's a, it's a great question. question. <laughs> no, I, the, well, before the cell phone thing, really quick, as you were saying, that's what this is all about. Minimalism, you know, you think of possessions, but this isn't, this possessions is just a tiny aspect of it. It's about thinking about the world in a totally different way from the monetized system that so many of us are wrapped into. It's about valuing relationships, love, experiences, the earth, the environment, other species. It's about valuing and loving those things more than stuff. And it's about living as much as possible in a way that is beneficial to the earth, to our communities and to ourselves and not detrimental. That's really, you know, that's the thing about minimalism. The more that I have gotten into this way of life, the things that I thought I'd get from it aren't the things that were the biggest. And a lot of what I've gotten from it is stuff I never ever would have fathomed or imagined. You just don't know where it's going to take you. And even if I told you where it took me, that's not where it's necessarily going to take you. Um, so it's a, it's just a journey of looking at life in a totally different way. Yeah. Hey, Rob, going back to um, uh, some very practical tips on, on, on how to get started. Uh, so what, so you started basically with the idea of going, go through all your stuff, the stuff that you really, that doesn't make you happier or healthier, uh, you haven't used for six to 12 months, put it aside and, and come up with and, and give a giveaway party and make sure that people don't bring any presents. Um, uh, you said whenever you buy something or you're thinking of buying something, actually think of the value in terms of time. Like, I think that's a, that's a great idea because it, it put so much more time there's nothing more precious than than time so why spend it on stuff that doesn't you know that doesn't give you much and just just this very short kick of the buy and then already you know you're trying to fill an insatiable hole basically inside yourself um what other tips what other practical tips do you have other tips so yeah. one that a lot of people practice is if you get something you have to get rid of something that's at least that way you will you might still have a lot of stuff but at least it's not getting worse at least your closets aren't getting more filled so if you get something get rid of something um let's see oh sharing that's one of the most important aspects of all this you know for example they say that the average electric drill only gets used for about half an hour in its entire lifetime so 99.99% of its existence, it's just sitting in a closet. So if instead you can share those things, it reduces resources needed, which reduces the environmental impact. And it reduces the amount of money because instead of buying a new one of things you're hardly ever going to use, you can share it with your neighbors. So you could look for, a, you know, a perfect example of sharing is a library. You don't need to buy new books. You can go to the library and that way, hundreds of people can use the same one. Now, there's there's libraries of things. There's tool Next, libraries. Do you know? Do you, do you know of apps? I know. I know of for for those who live in the Netherlands, and I think they operate in the UK, and I think in New York they just um, um, started. There are, there are apps as well, which are I use them. There's one called Peerbee, Peerbee.com, and um, it's it's. It's absolutely fantastic. I needed a charger for for some batteries that I I never never ever use, um, and I got I found the charger. It was really easy, and what I loved about it is also the social aspect. So it's not about me not spending that money, not wasting any resources, but actually I had a really nice chat with that lady who came and um, actually you know helped me to connect again. It's connecting with people as well. That's what what I love about sharing. Absolutely, it is. I mean sharing. Not sharing forces you to connect with your community in a time where it's easy, where you can just buy everything you need and have it in your home, uh, your house or your apartment. It makes it easy to not know any of your neighbors. But the less stuff you have and the more likely you are to need to borrow something, 
The more yeah. likely you are to knock on your neighbor's door and actually get to know your neighbors, which the benefits of that just cannot be overstated. Yeah, there's an interesting question here from Tanya Reis. Um, you mentioned last time uh, that you don't pay taxes, I think. Um, I don't know if that's correct, but I can imagine. Um, how do you vision that possible for a community without people paying taxes? That's, that's a very interesting question. Yeah, so here's the thing. Now, you can't look at what I'm doing linearly as, okay, here's what he's done to step outside of society. So how does that apply directly to the way that society is currently happening? Um, that is, so I'll explain that a little bit more. I don't pay taxes. And for what I think are very good reasons. One of the reasons is because it's between a quarter and a half of all taxes in the United States go towards war. Do I want my life to be funding the death of others in other parts of the world? Absolutely not. And then a huge portion of the taxes are used for things that I just truly don't support and don't mm -hmm. think make our communities a better place. So that's the reason that I don't. So the second part of the question is how do Sorry, you Sorry, Rob, can I ask you a question about that? Because so so those are very those are very principal reasons. How do you call that? Reasons out of principle or something. Um, but do you act, are you actually in the position that you should be paying taxes or are you just avoiding it because of your way of living? So, so the reality is because I've lived, I live a life of service to others and have so little money, I don't owe any taxes. I'm not no. evading taxes or anything like that because I only made $5,000 last year as an individual. If you make under $10,000, you don't owe any federal taxes. Yes. So in no way is what I'm doing illegal. Now, okay. what I personally do is I pay nearly a 100% tax to community and to the environment. And that is by 100% of media income. So my book, my TV shows, 100% of that is donated directly to environmental nonprofits, which are vastly underfunded by taxes where a lot, I mean, a huge portion of people would say we should be putting more taxes into things that truly benefit our community. So instead, what I do is I put all of that money into those things. So the reality is that, in effect, I pay a much higher tax rate, nearly 100% than just about anybody that I know. But I'm, gonna, I'm going about it in a different way. I am funneling the money into things that are really beneficial to the community and making the world a happier, healthier place rather than putting it into an area where some will be used for really community good and a huge portion will be used for something that none of us really, well, most of us really don't want. Um, and so how do you vision that possible for community without people paying taxes? That's the other part of the question is, so I'm not advocating for communities that have no such thing as taxes. I'm advocating for people that actually do want to pay, it doesn't have to be a tax. It can, if, if it's, you know, voluntary people coming together to make sure that we look after one another, because that's what a community needs is ultimately people that will help each other and make a system work. And so I totally agree. Yeah, I think, I do, I do think that the situation is I'm, I'm from the Netherlands, um, where uh, I would say that our experience and our culture towards paying taxes is very different from, from the U.S. perspective. Um, we see that a lot on our page as well, that, that in, in the U.S., a lot of people think that paying taxes is actually, it's theft, it's daylight robbery, uh, because they don't trust how the, um, uh, how, how the collected money is actually being used and how it's being put to service. Of course, we, we, have, we have critical people in the Netherlands as well, but... We get a lot of, you look at our unemployment and our healthcare system, for example, we all pay, you know, a substantial amount. Those people that can afford it um, pay, pay a substantial amount for their insurance. But those that cannot afford it, they get a lot of support. And we've got good infrastructure, we've got good public transport and all that. So I think it's an interesting point to make as well as like from a lot of Americans, it's like if you pay taxes, they're basically, it's like they're, they're stealing the money from you or well, actually like, myself and a lot of people that I know here in the Netherlands and in Scandinavian countries and Germany and other countries, they are pretty happy. You know, they're pretty, of course, there are always people complaining um, and, and there are things that the government can, can improve. 
but there's a very different attitude towards towards paying taxes, and we, we we do get great services. And of course, we've got homeless people and all that. But I think if you compare it to the situation in the U.S., uh, where the number of people that live under basically under the uh, well that are really poor according to uh, to global standards, it's uh, it's different. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So we're, yeah. Sorry. So I'm deviating a little bit no that is an important background difference because it's i would be much happier to be paying taxes in a place like the netherlands where it is used much more for the good of the everyday person um so yeah i am by no means anti-tax no. i'm only for not using taxes to destroy the world yeah okay well, i'll drink to that <laughs> yeah i'll have a, I'll have a gr- green tea t- green tea toast um, let's see, we've got a great, great question here from Karen. Karen, um, great to have you here. Um, don't you miss having your own place or is it exciting to stay in different places and areas all the time? Um, well, I don't miss having my own place and here's why. Again, as you go into minimalism as deep as I have, mm-hmm. again, it's not so much about just the possessions, it's about a whole mindset. Then you realize, I mean, when it comes down to it, I they I don't want my own place. I want community. I want an existence where we don't think we own the earth. You know, I don't think that we do own the earth. And I think that this idea that we need our own of everything is one of the probably most pressing mindsets that we have where it divides everything up. So I really focus on trying to inspire more community thinking than individual. And for me, that trumps the idea of just having my own place. Now, with that being said, what I'm going to do uh, this year is I'm building a small, tiny house like I had in San Diego, and I'll be doing a work exchange where I'll use someone's unused backyard and, uh, and in exchange, I'll grow food for them, do work around the yard, uh, basically just be of benefit to them, um, install rainwater harvesting, compost, probably get bees, all these things that they want, and do an exchange. So I'll have my own little nook, but I won't own the land because I don't want to practice land ownership or ownership in general. Um, so that's a little bit of thoughts on that. Yeah. So going back to the things that you still own, Rob, which... What is your top three favorite things that you would, you would, you know, you would die get, having to get rid of? Which three things would that be? Okay, well, let's see. Um, I wouldn't die getting rid of any of them. All of them would be fine. However, the top, you know, important things to me are one, my bicycle. But I'm not attached to my bicycle necessarily, but a bicycle because it's basically a form of being able to get around that costs no money or next to no money uh, that also keeps me in shape and gets me out into the community. Yeah. So a bicycle is one really important one. Um, yeah. I've got essential oil, lavender essential oil, and this is a really uh, central, it smells great. <laughs> yeah. Really central part of my life. Um, the other side. <laughs> So lavender uh, helps uh, relax you, alleviate. I mean, I actually feel better already just sniffing that. <laughs> so, Wish you were um, here. I always carry this and I always have eucalyptus as well, which is a natural antimicrobial. Um, a couple other things. A headlamp is one thing that is one of my most beneficial things, whether it's just... Never leave home without it. Yeah, whether it's just... <laughs> Reading at night, um, this uses far less electricity than an overhead light, um, and I can charge it with a little solar panel. Or whether it's if I'm out hiking or camping, um, dumpster diving, the headlamp is a pretty uh, important thing to me. Um, a reusable bag for grocery shopping is another possession. Yeah. I've had this reusable bag. It's called a Chico bag, mm-hmm. and I've had this one for about five years so i've you know shopped with it and dumpstered over it many 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 times yeah so of course this i mean there is a slight amount of sentimental value to this because i've had it for five years yeah. but 
it's just a plastic, I mean, a, a reusable plastic bag. So it's just an item. Yeah. Okay. And um, so those are some of your favorite things. And then what do you have next on your list? So what's, when can we talk again? You have 110 possessions and what is, wh which one did you give away or what's that going to be? What would you like to get rid of? Let me put it that way. What would you like to be able to get rid of? Well, actually, I'm plugging in my computer right now. Yeah. The reality is that this uh, Ask Me Anything, this, this Q&A session we're doing, will be my official last video uh, or discussion where I truly only own around 100 possessions because um, I'm still going to be very minimalist. But now that yeah. I'm after two years of traveling and I just moved to Orlando a month ago, now I'm going to be doing a lot of gardening. Uh, I'm getting going to be doing a lot of community programs. Um, I'm building this little tiny house. So my possessions are going to increase um, maybe to 500, um, maybe to 1,000, although my intentions are – Shame on you, Rob. Shame on you. Because when I say possessions, I mean, I mean my 111 – that includes each pair of underwear. That includes my passport, my social security card. Um, that is every little thing. So yeah. imagine if you have a wallet with all these cards and credit cards, that could be to me about a hundred possessions just in a wallet alone. Yeah. Um, but so at this point, yeah, I'm not getting rid of, I'm still, you know, I get rid of a few things here and there, but actually I'll be uh, adding some possessions to my life. But the point, the purpose will be to do only add things that again add value to my life. Yeah, I Rob, and and um, I, I think we spoke about this uh, some time ago. Um, very interesting topic, and I've seen some questions as well about about this from to look at minimalism from a different angle, uh, where you live together with your with your partner. Um, I, for example, me, I'm married and I've got two kids. They're three kids. Sorry, I've got three kids. I'm losing count. They're 13, 15, almost 15, and 21. Um, what advice do you have in terms of how to start with a minimalist, uh, minimalism lifestyle for families? Is there some advice that you can give to them and me? Yeah, absolutely. So, I know there's some great resources out there. You know, it's best to take the advice from families themselves. And so what I would do is go on Instagram, Facebook, go on the internet and type in like minimalist families or minimalism with children. And you'll probably find some really great resources. In fact, if any of you out there know of any great resources, any minimalist yeah. families, yeah. Um, comment those and we can shout them out. But um, really... The thing that, you know, I've been seeing is that, you know, recently I read a study that the more toys a kid has, actually that can be detrimental because it leaves out the curiosity and the creativity when they have their, when they have instant gratification all the time, uh, it, it, they can lose their attention spans massively. And these are things that are really important in development, childhood and adulthood. So I would say, you know, really look at this and ask, you know, point. what do you yeah. want yeah. Uh, for your child? Is, you know, you want to give them that, that great childhood, but you do have to ask whether giving them the great childhood of so much stuff actually can be a disservice to them in the long run. So that's just, you know, one important thought. But um, also just as far as tips go, a lot of the same things apply. Maybe you want to put your money into family vacations and family experiences that will last a lifetime rather than toys or things like that. So I would really say, you know, base your family, not on your stuff, but on your relationships and on your love for one another. Yeah. Beautiful. Let's see. Let's see if there are some people, I don't know if there are people that came up with um, a couple of suggestions on, um, if there are families or pages that we could uh, recommend, 
um, for families. I will definitely look into it myself. And um, if there aren't, then we will we'll do some research and we'll put them in the, uh, in the comment section below. I know they're out there and I've seen them. I'm sure there are. Yeah. I just can't remember any off the top of my head. But I meet parents. All I mean, a lot of my friends have kids and they uh, live pretty simple life. I met a woman actually two nights ago. Debbie was her name and her and her kids actually live in a van, uh, you know, in, in a really nice setup, though. Um, and uh, they live a very simple, minimalistic life. But I've also met many parents that don't live in a van down by the river or anything like that and have a house. Uh, oh, actually, you know who's to look up? Um, look up Bea Johnson. She is one of the zero waste, the founders of the current zero waste movement. And she's got two children um, and she is all she's, you know, her focus is more zero waste, but ultimately her house is total minimalist um, and she's a really great resource. OK, excellent. Well, shall we, let's put the link. We'll put the link in uh, below later. It's zero um, waste home dot com i believe great and there's another question about uh the website that was mentioned for sharing items we'll put that in in a second as well we just want to concentrate on, on the actual uh, live here uh, but it's peer b dot com so that's p double -E e r b y dot com that's and, and i know that there are there are many um let's see if there are some other questions uh, rob that we can take i don't know how how are you time wise um, we, we've got a little more time still. There were two questions that we were trying to ask, ask before that we kept getting sidetracked one. One was, do I have a cell phone? Yes, exactly. And do you have that as organized? Yeah. 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 I don't have a cell phone. Uh, I got rid of my phone about four or five years ago. I have a blog about why I got rid of my cell phone. If you just go to robgreenfield.tv slash cell phone. Um, but basically, that was the last bill that I had, uh, and that was the last one that I got rid of. And now what I use is Google Voice, which just means whenever I'm on Wi-Fi, I can make or receive unlimited calls or texts for free, and it just goes right through my Gmail. Um, I am extremely organized with my online life because online clutter can also lead to mental clutter. So. Yeah. I keep my inbox very clean uh, always because otherwise my, I, I can't handle not, I can't handle an inbox full of junk. Unsubscribing to spam is one thing that I did a long time ago. So, you know, it took some time up front, but now I don't have a cluttered yeah. inbox because I got rid of that. Um, so, yes, no cell phone, but I use the internet a lot. And yeah. then there was another question. Oh, do I have credit cards? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, that's another one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But just just before you get into that, let's see. There's a, we got this recommendation. So it's in the re the recommendation is in the comments below. Uh, thank you, Nicole, for letting us know about Joshua Becker, who wrote "Clutter Free with Kids: Change Your Thinking, Discover New Habits, Free Your Home, and Others." So we'll definitely I'll definitely go and uh, and look that up. Thank you. Yeah. All right. and I, yeah. Um, um, my publisher which is New Society Publishers, they actually have a handful of amazing books for families with mm -hmm. children, not just on minimalism, but just on the whole, you know, how to exist as a family who cares about the environment. Um, so newsociety.com is their website. And I was just looking through their catalog actually last month and saw a lot of books that I looked that I thought looked amazing for um, for families with children. Right, so that's this one, right? Newsociety.com, is that the one? I should just double check, newsociety.com, yep. Excellent, all right, let's see. Um, the other question was, do I have credit cards? Yes. And I don't, I got rid of my last credit card um, maybe three years ago, summer of 2014, and that was a huge step for me because the thing is, credit cards, although they can be used very wisely and, and very well, uh, they are one of the leading ways that people end up getting stuck in situations they don't like. And I think the average American has about seven or $15,000 in credit card debt. And debt can be very crippling. When you're in debt, it's hard to live the life you want because you're struggling to even get to 
you know, zero. You're at a negative point. And so I've, I've worked off the debt that I did have. And um, I would strongly suggest if you do want to live a minimal, minimalistic life to have at least less credit cards. I started with seven credit cards um, because I would play the points game for airlines back in the day. Um, so at least getting it down to maybe just one, reducing the number of ways that you can get into debt so that you are able to live financially minimalistic. Um, and also the thing is, if you have credit cards, you're more able to buy stuff. That's what credit cards enable you to do. With credit cards, it's very easy to buy stuff online. And so because I don't have a personal credit card, it makes it much more challenging for me to buy stuff. Um, and so what I have to, you know, convenience is kind of one of the greatest enemy in minimalism. I shouldn't use the word enemy, but, um, the more convenient things are, the more likely they are to do them. And so what I do is I force myself into situations where things become inconvenient and yeah. that allows me to follow my morals and my ideals more. It's a really interesting point you're making. If you, you probably don't do, I don't know if you, well, I don't know, maybe with friends you use Uber, for example, which in itself is a wonder, it's a wonderful service, but as it is a completely seamless experience where you don't take out your, you don't even take out your credit card anymore. It's just that you just, you know, you get the car, you, you get in, you get off, and you, many times, you know, you don't even know how much money you actually spend. And the seamless spending is what you just mentioned. It's, it's very convenient, but it's also really, really dangerous because you don't, you know, you don't put any att attached values to it anymore. Um, until you actually get your credit card statements and then you're basically fucked. So that's yeah. very, very true. Very Absolutely. True. Now, and Uber is kind of an interesting one because that's a great example of sharing. Well, can... sorry. So, yeah, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead with the sharing. Yeah, go ahead. Well, sorry. Yeah, basically like car share programs are amazing because cars typically sit for 95% of their life in your driveway. So, yes. you know, Things like Uber and Lyft are, are amazing because it means you can be car free, but still have a car when you need it. So it is something that I would recommend. The thing that's tough about it is, yeah, I mean, I can't personally use it because I don't have a credit card. I occasionally take Ubers with friends, um, but um, that one has its, its its positive aspect and its negative aspect. Yeah. Just um, um, so you don't have a smartphone anymore. Um do you are are you sometimes in situations where you're like shit? I wish I I did have a smartphone or or I, I mean I I am ad I I'll be honest I I'm addicted and I'm you know, I'm trying to cut to cut it. I mean Jesus, difficult. Um, there's nothing to cut because there's no line. But um, do you how how do you how do you what what is your your, your what are your thoughts about people staring at their smartphones all the time? Yeah, so I was that person. And that's why I had to get rid of it because I didn't like what I was doing. I didn't like who I was where, you know, as I started to pay attention to it, for example, I was at a restaurant waiting for friends. I didn't have anything to check on my phone, but there, what I did is I picked it up because then I looked busy because then people would think, oh, he's doing something rather than just some guy there waiting on his own. So it was a social crutch basically. Um, and that's not healthy to have those sorts of crushes, crutches. So that was just one element. And then the other thing was just the amount of conversations I would have where I was only half present. And so in 2014, I decided to get rid of my cell phone. And undoubtedly, there are times where it would be convenient to have one. But the amount that I've gained from it is worth the times where I wish I had one because yeah. sure again there's times where it would help but most of the time my life is far better because I don't have one I you know once you get rid of your phone you realize it is possible to exist after I got rid of my phone I tapped myself on the chest and I was like okay I'm still here I still exist yeah because yeah. I didn't know I mean I was addicted to it um and it took me a couple years where I didn't think it would be possible to live without one before I got to the idea like, okay, maybe I can do this. Yeah. So again, the benefits outweighed the downsides. And that's really what it comes down to is no matter what you're doing, there's going to be the positives and negatives. And it's about doing the situation that far outweighs 
the negatives. Yeah, it's all about finding that balance. I mean, because we uh, we uh, we are in contact on a on a regular basis, but you're not always there. Um, but it, it never, you know, e everything can wait, right? Except for this Facebook Live, really couldn't wait. Uh, but you were there, yeah. so you are the living example. It's like you are not off the grid. It's not like you don't exist. You know, you are very connected with the world, and 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 you use digital tools. So I mean, we yeah, we met once, and when you were in the Netherlands. Um, but if you look at the relationship that you could actually build via digital means, I think it's I'm very I'm very excited about that. Um, and I feel like I can't live without my phone, but it's absolutely that, that's wrong because you show that you can be digitally connected with the world without being, you know, connected all the time. Yeah, absolutely. And um, one person just said, "How mm -hmm. do I talk to my mom?" Well, there's Skype, there's Facebook, there's yeah. I use Google Voice to my talk to my mom. So not having a cell phone. Yeah, there you go. Carolyn asked, "How does he ever talk to his mom?" <laughs> it's so <laughs> sweet. You don't yeah. need a cell phone to talk to your mom at all. And that's the thing, you know, <laughs> is that, again, you know, we are very trapped in this way of life and this way of thinking to the point where we think there is no other way. But there, there's a other way for everything. There's 7 billion people on Earth. It's a very diverse community of, of people that exist on Earth. And Whatever is around you may seem normal, but there is no normal. It's just what you're accustomed to. There's hundreds of different cultures that do things in totally different ways. And once you realize that everything in life is a matter of perspective, you stop asking those questions like, but how does he talk to his mom? Because you realize, oh, there's other ways for everything. Yeah. Maybe even once in a while visit her, you know. <laughs> that's, a, that's ideal. I mean, I visit her every year. The last, yeah. in my, on my three bike rides across the country, two of them, I went to my mom's house on them. Nice. And we got a, a question um, from, and you have to correct me if I spell this wrong. Well, actually, all right, here we go. This is one of my possessions. I need my glasses <laughs> here. Um, this, there's um, um, a question from Abu Talar Amir, and sorry for my terrible pronunciation. I dare you to pronounce my name correctly, Michiel de Hoyer. Um, when did this idea come into your life and what was the reason? Is there sort of like a pivotal moment? And can you maybe describe a little bit more about the life that you used to live? Sure. Um, well, basically what happened is in 2011, I was living a fairly normal life. And I started to realize that almost everything that I was doing was causing destruction to the world. To so what's normal, right? The normal life, just the gas that I was pumping yeah. into my car, the groceries I was getting at the grocery store, the stuff I was buying at the big box stores, the yeah. things that I was buying online, the, uh, the water that I was drinking, the electricity. I was That's using. what we define as normal, and actually it's pretty strange. Yes, all of these normal things every day. And what happened is once I started to actually ask, where does this come from? How did it get to me? Who made it? You know, who paid the price? Those, those sorts of things. Then I started to realize that every single action of my life was causing destruction to the world, to people, uh, both people nearby and on the other side of the world, making my stuff, to animals, to the, you know, yeah. the millions of other species. But you mentioned, for example, Rob, and I think this goes for many people, it's like watching certain documentaries. It's about, you know, getting new insights that you didn't have before. What type of, you mentioned the name of the documentary, I forgot about it. Maybe you can mention that again. Uh, what, what was it? That Absolutely. So, yeah, it was educating myself via books and documentaries. Um, yes. Some of the early documentaries, one was Food Inc. You know, food was a big one, just realizing the globalized industrial food system, where food comes from and the impact it has on the world. So Food Inc. was a really important one to me early on. The yep. short film series, The Story of Stuff, um, which are available on YouTube for free, was another really big uh, early one. Actually, Zeitgeist was a big eye-opener for me, even though that documentary has some inaccuracies. Overall, the message was something that extremely resonated with me. Um, and I have a, a list of the documentaries that uh, influenced me earlier on. If you go to robgreenfield.tv slash films, 
Those are documentaries I recommend. And if you go to robgreenfield.tv slash books, those are a lot of books I recommend. And while I'm on that note, my website is a plethora of information uh, when it comes to, you know, getting rid of stuff, downsizing, living simply, living with less money. So most of the things we've talked about over the last hour, there's further writing on that. Um, yes. If you go to robgreenfield.tv slash timeline, that's basically my timeline of transformation from an everyday person to, well, I'm still an everyday person, but living what would be considered a normal life to what now is considered, a, you know, quite different life for most people. And it goes through the many different changes that I've made. And the idea of that is to really sort of show like how you can slowly chip away to become the you, the, the whole you that you, you know, really may want to be. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Rob. We'll put, we'll put the, uh, basically people should go to robgreenfield.tv so, and then you can do slash timeline slash cell phone. Uh, what was the other one again? Books. Films. Books. Exactly. People is people that I recommend. Um, all sorts of resources on there. Wonderful. All right. Um, let's see if there, let's see. Yeah. I think we need, we're going to wrap up, uh, Rob. What do you, what do you think? Shall we, shall we take one more question or what do we do? That's yeah, big. we can do one more question and that works. I've got a big volunteer garden day today. A bunch of people are coming over to work in the garden. So, uh, yeah. excited to do that. Let's see to get from point where the app. Yeah, it's a, this is a difficult one. There's somebody asking, but it's, we're not gonna, it's, um, Tom, thanks for your question, but I think it's too biggie for now. What are your thoughts about digital currency, Rob? Um, let's see that this is an interesting one. There's somebody who said, um, I don't know a whole lot of female, uh, minimalists. And I do think that there actually are. Um, I know of one which is called, I think she's called the trash. Trash girl, uh, trash is for tossers. Oh, I don't okay. know her name. You probably yeah. know her, Rob. Did, did, you, did you meet? Do you know her? Yeah, Lauren Singer. Oh. She's definitely a minimalist. A lot of times, zero waste and minimalism go hand in hand. Um, so she's definitely one. Again, Bea Johnson, which is zero waste home. Um, there's, there are a lot out there. All you got to do to find them is is really look, um, and you'll find that them out there. Yeah, exactly. All right. Um, then I have just one more question for the, for, the, for the people out there that are still watching. And thank you all so much for tuning in and for, for all your comments and likes and loves and shares and everything. Um, this was my first real, well, sort of like important uh, Facebook Live, and I absolutely loved it. Um, thank you. Thank you so much, Rob. But I'd like to know from the people that are still watching, what kind of topic would they like to discuss next time? So um, also on the, this is also, I think it's, it's good. We'll put the link in, in the comments in a second. We made a video uh, with Rob um, about minimalism and, and he has six tips for beginners. So you can just watch that video. It's a three and a half, it's just like a three minute video. Um, and we're going to do um, a series of those type of videos. So what kind of topics would you like to learn from, from, uh, from Rob? What kind of topics would that be? And uh, then we will create a new video. And then after that, we will do the, again, the, uh, the Facebook Live as well. Um, so if people can send in any suggestions, do let us know. We'll read all of them. You can also just leave a comment later. Also, when this is, you're watching this, it's not live anymore. Leave us the comments. We'll look at all of them and um, we'll use it as um, as fuel, basically, as input for for our next our our, our next video. Um, Rob, anything else you'd like to say? I would just like to say, you know, if you're listening out there, uh, don't be overwhelmed. Whatever situation you're in is the only that's what you have right now. And so, my hopes is that through this conversation that you've just tuned into, um, maybe you've thought of one thing that you are inspired about. Maybe you've thought of one way that you can be of more benefit to your community, one more way you can live more simply, and just don't wait, do that one thing, and that one thing will empower you. And then just take it one step at a time. Great change, doesn't ha happen overnight. It starts with one small change, and then another one and another one. Just like becoming a professional uh, sports player, 
You don't do that overnight. And it's the same with simple living, sustainable living, minimalism. You have to start somewhere and you have to practice. Exactly. Well, Rob, you totally convinced me, but you already did. Thank you so much, man. I greatly enjoyed it. What I really, and I told you this before, I'll tell it again because we now still got some viewers. Um, what I love about you, uh, well, there are many things. I love your smile and everything, but I, I love the way that you um, embody everything that you teach people, you know, that, and you show that actually having less gives you a richer life. Um, you know, it's, it, and, and yet, like nothing, it, nothing comes easy. Sometimes, you know, life, life can be tough. Um, but yeah, the way, the way you live your life, for me, you're, you're a big example. So uh, I hope to continue to learn from you. And I want to thank all the viewers and everybody who commented in the channel, la, la, la. Thank you so much. It was absolutely wonderful. We felt the energy. And um, so uh, keep an eye out on, uh, on Rob's Facebook page, on Bright Vibes. And uh, thank you all so much. Have a great day. Have a great evening. And uh, we hope to see you soon. Thanks, thank Rob. You. Look forward Bye. to seeing you again soon. Thanks. Bye. Oh, this is sort of like a high five. But yeah. All right. Bye. Yes, Bye. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> thank you. Bye. Bye.